Next up, we have Scott Hain from the University of Maryland. Um, Scott has published some very important books uh, for us, including The World of the Paris Café, Sociability Among the French Working Class, 1789 to 1914. And he's also uh, a co-editor of The Thinking Space, The Café as Cultural Institution in Paris, Italy, and Vienna. His new work is on café sociability and government regulation in the 1930s and 1940s. Today, Scott Hain will give us a paper entitled <coughs> The Drama of Daily Life, Simone de Beauvoir's Literary and Autobiographical Writings on Café Life During World War II. <coughs> Thank you. Since I submitted this title, I have decided to narrow my focus. In this paper, I will just cover the first 16 days of Simone de Beauvoir's wartime diary. This diary is among the richest sources I have ever found on the events and daily life of cafes. A full analysis of the contents could easily take 40, 50 pages. I'm just going to highlight a few vital sections. And this, indeed, is part of my larger study. In the book that just came out, I don't have any slides, but I'll just briefly note the um, cover of The Thinking Space. I looked at the critique of dialectical reason, the 1960 book of Sartre on sociology, the sociology of revolution, and trace back an important theme in the book the group infusion back to his World War II era, noting that even in being in nothingness, he gives us an example of what he would call the group infusion, which in, in essence said when a group of serial people, basically isolated individuals who gather, let's say, to get on a bus, when they suddenly are confronted with a crisis, often they become a group in fusion. They begin to unite and act collectively. For Sartre, in being in nothingness, the first example he gives is of an auto accident or some other accident on the street outside of a cafe. And what the cafe customers do is unite to help the individual who's been in trouble or hurt. Later in the Critique of Dialectical Reason, 1960, we see him doing an analysis on something that is much more historically significant, the fall of the Bastille. But as I say, he really gets this germ of an idea from World War II, from um, living in Paris, and I would argue probably from reading the war diary of Simone de Beauvoir before, of course, it was published. So I want in this paper to go over in a very dense analysis of a few of the crucial entries of de Beauvoir about the whole way in which she comes into politics. Danielle Salnave in her Castor de Guerre published in 2008, talks about how Simone de Beauvoir comes into a social and political consciousness during the wartime occupation. Looking at her war diary, which begins on September 1st, 1939, we see the role of the cafe immediately. And I'm going to be quoting extensively from here on out. I had breakfast at 10 o'clock at Ray's, the Brasserie aux Trois Mousquetaires, Avenue de Men. The newspaper printed Hitler's demands without commentary or emphasis on the disquieting nature of the news. There was no talk of gas either. I didn't know what to think. De Beauvoir probably picked up this uh, paper at a kiosk nearby the cafe. Uh, she continues, I went to the dome with nothing to do. In a quandary, there were few customers. I had barely ordered my coffee when a waiter announced they declared war on Poland. One customer was reading Paris Midi. Others rushed over to him and also to the newspaper stands where Paris Midi had not yet come in. I got up and ran back 
to the Hotel Mistral to wait for Sartre. We see here the cafe, the cafe waiter is a sort of town crier, a person who sort of directs the customers to what is going on in current events. <clears throat> when she gets back to the Mistral, she goes out with Sartre to eat pastries at the Murat, another cafe, and finds a place deserted and somber. Made conversation with Sorrow King, one of her friends, without too much trouble. My mind was almost blank. From time to time, I fell into a daze, got to check news, nothing, leave Sorokin and go to the Via Deck Cafe below the Passy metro station. Passy completely deserted, all the homes closed up, and not a single soul on the street. Unending lines of cars passing, crammed with suitcases. Sartre arrived, mobilization orders, go on foot to the Boulevard Montmartre, ate a little at the Dupont, another cafe, went by metro to ca the Cafe Ray, then on foot to the Cafe Floor. This time it looks more serious, observes a waiter. But people were still cheerful, and underlying everything before me, an incomprehensible horror. September 2nd, got up at 3 o'clock, walked to the Cafe Dome, silence. It was a very balmy night. Both the dome and the rotund were dimly lit. The dome was quite noisy, many uniforms. On the terrace, two officers flanked by two whores, one of them humming a tune to herself without thinking. The officers paid no attention to them. Laughter and shouts inside. We had coffee. We spent a while on a terrace in this early mild and almost cheerful morning. As long as I was walking, I would be all right. I stopped at the Dupont Street, uh, the Café Dupont on Saint-Michel, and started to write. When one is writing, one doesn't think either. Goes on, go to Jurassi and have lunch at La Copole. I ate, went to the dome and wrote letters, then took Metro and goes to a movie. On the streets, people talk little. I stopped to see Toulouse, a, a woman not mentioned, uh, full name, in a cafe on one of the boulevards. Tonight's cafe's closed at 11 o'clock. No more nightclubs. Then on to September 3rd. I could not count on the day's sweep that yesterday sustained me all day long. I don't feel the sorrow is within me. It's, outs it's the outside world. That's horrible. We turned on the radio. No response yet to the last communications from France and England. They are still fighting in Poland. There is no hope left. Mail delivery is very irregular. I had my coffee at Ray's. Everything is frozen in me. Remembrances, future, and even perception. Every time the body stops moving, looking, or thinking, tears well up. I thought I would be able to work, but not in my room. In a cafe. Paris seems gathered in on itself, individualized. This getting back to the notion of Sartre's concept of seriality, people sort of frozen in their own individual shells. I went to see JJ. She looked so cute. Here we see daily life and ordinary concerns suddenly intruding in on her experiences in the cafe. She looked so cute in her pretty white blouse. Pardo was there and another fellow who had striking blue eyes. We chatted a while about Poupette Simone de Beauvoir's sister, who was a painter, about vacation, relaxation. We went to the dome where Jirasi was eating chicken with rice. All four of us had lunch together. Pardo was betting against JJ and me that there would be no war. My neighbor and Englishman said the same thing. In the meantime, the rumor was spreading that England had already declared war. Our discussion took place in a state of vague hopefulness, or at least uncertainty. The blue-eyed fellow arri arrived, and Ella Pardo, Pardo's sister, he vaguely tried to defend the USSR. 
The dome put up heavy blue drapes for the blackout. Suddenly, at half past three, Paris Paris Soir announced England has declared war at 11 o'clock. France will follow suit at five o'clock in the afternoon. A tremendous shock despite everything. Again, like a flash, the idea boast <coughs> her lover is going to get killed. I return to my place in tears. It is within this context that we see de Beauvoir's first really developing a visceral sense of social solidarity. And we see this the following day, Sunday, September 3rd. I calmed down and went out. The streets had a serious air about them. On the Place Montmartre, a scuffle. A woman, I think, had called some fellow a foreigner, and he yelled at her. The people protested. The municipal guard intervened and grabbed the fellow by the hair. Protests from the crowd. The guards got confused and told the people to move along. In general, the crowd seemed hostile to this hostility against the foreigner, quote unquote. I went to the cafe floor and wrote to boast. JJ arrived at six o'clock in the evening. She was upset and had tears in her eyes. Ella Pardo joined us. She talked to me about her separation from her friend, whom she had suddenly, who she had left suddenly in the middle of the street, unable to go to the station with him. Pardo joked and laughed. Some people at the cafe floor were still saying that they didn't believe in the war, but they said it with somber faces. I made JJ talk about the people at the floor, impression of being connected to everyone. Amidst the moving and milling about, I felt no personal life, only the community, which, li which lives in itself as in primitive societies. The entry for the following day, September the 4th, reveals that this dawning of social solidarity was still just temporary. You see her, as you've already seen, really fluctuating wildly in emotions at this moment when the war is about to start. And she continues, wake up. I had an emotional flashback of normal awakenings. Days have a certain rhythm. Evening means fever, a breaking down. One thinks of getting drunk, of crying, and doing just about anything and one gets lost in the crowd. Morning is lucidity. The horrible world is on the outside. And this morning, for an hour or two, I withdraw from the world. On the balcony of the Gilles, uh, a friend of Sartre's, I noticed red flowers and a woman, probably the concierge. I bought La Laisson and read it at Le Cup Copelade, another cafe. War was nowhere. Yet, cafes were not necessarily a haven for her, though she will go in and out on this point, too. She goes on, Sartre and I are not separated. I absolutely refuse to think, and in quotation marks, I will see him again. I just simply continue to be in the same world as he, with him. I read with interest Gide's journal, for a while and had lunch at the Dome. Jirasi stopped by for a moment. Paris Midi announced that military operations had begun on land and sea, nothing more. How neat they make it look. The pale face of little boast always haunts me like an obsession. I sent him La de Lasson and called Madame Malsy, Sartre's mother. Later, I got off at Solferino and went to the cafe floor where I wrote to Poupette and their dream. Pardo came and complained. He was feverish and had tears in his eyes. He was off his rocker. His friend Philippe Aubery said hello. He told us the story of volunteers who were ready and willing to die. Perry Coe, the fellow of Up with the Dead, invented this appeal to all the lame and crippled, those who have nothing to lose by losing their life and who therefore should offer it as a sacrifice to their country. He read from an awe-inspiring letter from a guy, and I quote, I am 32 years old, have one arm, one eye, I believed in my life, had no more meaning. 
but you gave me back my existence by restoring all its glory to the, wor to the world. Sir, glory to the word, sir. The guy ended his letter by requesting that, they, that the half-demented also be drafted. Madame Patisson, Countess Monterey, often mentioned by Poupet, announced that she joined the Garibaldian volunteers. Conversations. The manager of the cafe floor announced that the cafe would close tomorrow. It may be sad. It was a good little carceria. It is funny to see people in uniform. Breton as an officer at the floor and at the dome, little Manicats as a soldier of the other war. Caesarea refers to a bullfighting term in Spanish, and it basically means a place that becomes a haven. I ironically, of course, the floor will reopen, of course, and be in many ways the second home of de Beauvoir and Sartre during the war. The, then the Hungarian arrived, a person she met at the Bay Inn. He sat down across from me to announce a little pompous and stammering that he was going to enlist. When I asked him why, he only gestured vaguely. Next to me, an aviator, half drunk and half crazy, said to him, in a noble tone, Sir, allow me to offer you a drink. They drank, drank brandy and discussed the foreign legion the Hungarian saying that he wouldn't want to be with the riffraff. They were discussing air raids. The aviator didn't think they would use gas, but possibly liquid air bombs, and advised that people go to the shelters. Everyone talked about an air raid for tonight. Never had Paris been so dark. JJ and Pardo returned. They were terribly tense and depressed. We went up to the dome in their little car. The night was pitch black. We took a table at the terrace. I told them stories even though I had a terrific headache. At half past 10, we returned to their place. I was going to sweep. There was, again, an air raid announcement. <clears throat> Basically, she <coughs> falls asleep like a baby. Thursday, September 14th, skipping on. I just love this moment after the morning tea when I go to get my mail. Alone, do some errands, and ride a little all alone. The news of the war remains unchanged. The Poles are resisting. They took back Loditz, and the rain is holding up the German advance. There are severe restrictions inside Germany, and it is said, discontent. All in, all, all in all, the war hasn't really started for us. When there is real fighting and boasts will be actually under fire, when Paris is being bombed, everything will look different. One cannot really believe, emphasis de Beauvoir's, that this will happen, which explains the strangely neutral state in which we find ourselves these days. Paris is reopening its movie houses and even bars and dance halls are open until 11 o'clock at night. Everything is returning to normal. Rent records at Bobino, the news, the cinema. Afterwards, we go to the du Dupont on the exact square where I used to go for breakfast with Boast, and we discuss, this, we discuss Casa's story project. So the sense that she wants to return somehow to the pre-war period, and suddenly there's a brief lull in the war. I'll finish with Friday, the sep September 15th entry. Sartre finally received my first long letter. I was happy about it. Always the same routine existence, tea and conversation. I wrote him a note and went to Vedrine at the Rally Cafe, met up with Koss at the Dome, bought some tobacco. The waiters were teasing us. <clears throat> I like a little of all this tobacco, they said. We really acted like pen pals of soldiers on the front lines. In the restroom of the dome, we made up huge parcels. parcels. We had lunch at the milk bar. For a while, Koss spoke child, childishly about politics, but not for long. We walked 
to the DuPont on the Saint Michel. I wrote to Sartre and several other short letters. Koss wrote to Boast. Then we went to see Snow White. It was insipid. <laughs> but <clears throat> um, after this, she basically leaves Paris and goes out to the provinces. I, I've summarized some of the key points of her wartime diary. I didn't include one uh, entry where she talks about how there's this person in the cafe that sort of looks like Hitler. But the overall point I want to get at is the sense that here is an incredibly intense, focused <coughs> set of impressions, not only about herself, but about living essentially in cafes during the war. And what I hope this does is go beyond a study of cafes that, let's say, looks at anecdotes or functions of cafes to be able to really say that there is a narrative quality about cafe life and that one can do a history of cafes that has a sweep, a scope, a storyline. Cafes are much more than, if you will, places that have functions. A battlefield, for example, is a space that we focus on what happens on the battlefield rather than on the battlefield per se. And I hope in the evolution of the study of the cafe that we move from a study of functions and anecdotes to a sense of what were the ongoing events, the long-term trends that were going on in cafes. And I think what we see in Simone de Beauvoir's war diary in this first dramatic set of impressions, a person, a society that is having rapidly fluctuating emotions, thoughts, and feelings. But out of this is going to emerge a sense of sort of unconscious solidarity that is going to be very important in the life and writings of both de Beauvoir and of Jean-Paul Sartre. Thank you very much. <laughs>